Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of statistics, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and an enormous selection of players and stat options are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million football fans who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code GET100. That's code GET100 at prizepicks.com slash get100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to Sebastian Vettel's B Hotel. I hope you've checked in because in this hotel, well, we're going to be talking about lots and lots of weird and wacky things that happened in Japan, including firstly, a B Hotel. I have seen the entire race weekend. I'm firstly amazed by the quality of racing we've got. I'm amazed that Daft Punk can actually go in a Formula 1 car and push his team midwire and not get a penalty. I'm amazed that we can get Red Bull Racing winning a Constructors' Championship with just one driver. But what I'm mostly more amazed of is that we now have a hotel for bees, but we barely have any hotel for all the fans right here. Go to the Belgian GP as well because they tend to get stuck up and live in towns that are 300 kilometers away from the circuit. Guys and girls, did you understand what a bee hotel is? The silence proves a lot. The silence clearly proves a lot. This wasn't planned, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) See, that's the quirky (laughs) part about the Japanese GP, right? We often tend to come to the circuit thinking of how weird the fans are. We often tend to think of how weird the circuit is with a figure of eight. We tend to talk about how weird the racing is. But there are so many things about this weekend that just don't add up. The B Hotel doesn't add up. Sorry, I've gone way too much about it. But for most people as well, Kunal, Sergio Perez going out of the garage after apparently being retired and then serving a penalty and coming back and then retiring the car again, that too doesn't add up. But you you think it's totally all right. And you're also with the FIA on that train. So why? Why is it okay? Yes, it is okay. And before I go there, now I'm going to try and do a bit of brain racking. A B hotel. Is it a hotel where you go to stay and in the room, you'll have a beehive and then you have to cover yourself, be in bed, be in a blanket and just save yourself from being stung. Is I wonder if that's a bee hotel. But no, in all seriousness, or, I think the word is... The word is? Or apiculture, because an uncle of mine living in the hinterlands of Norway actually has had a bee hotel. And I'm not making it up. You, it's, it's a, he, was, he's, he, was a bee, he is actually a bee farmer. I mean, we used to get the purest farm-to-table produce of honey ever since I can remember. So, but you know, the, the important question. Now, I'm going to I'm going to turn it around. Sebastian Vettel, for all his sustainability talk, and I want to save the planet, which is, by the way, fantastic. He chose to do a bee hotel project in a race where you need to travel the farthest yes. from Europe to do so. Right, and this is a man, ladies and gentlemen, Sundaram and Somal. This is a man, this is a driver, a former world champion who actually drove to all the European circuits last year to reduce his carbon footprint. It's, I don't know. Is it just me that it doesn't add up to? It's like the the whole Perez retiring, coming back and whatever. I, I don't know. Lots of fun things to discuss on this episode. But I, I love how suddenly, Sundaram, Sebastian Vettel has so much time in the world that apart from now talking positively about Lance Stroll and apart from trying to find a solution for how to make Aston Martin work, he's now focusing on things like making a B. Hey, it seems like such a silly problem to have. Like there are bigger problems in the world. Like how do we make Sergio Perez go faster? There are bigger problems. Like, how do we make sure that the, both the Mercedes driver don't end up killing each other uh, in a couple of races' time? Because that seems to be on their agenda for Russell and Hamilton. But we are hell-bent. Hell-bent on having all the drivers together to support the bees. I, I like it. 
You know, it's, it's all in a good initiative, seeing Sebastian Vettel doing all of this. But I was most disappointed not seeing him in an F1 car around Suzuka. Yeah. And I mean, those were the rumors. Those were the rumors everywhere that Sebastian Vettel is already there. Perhaps Lance Stroll is injured for the race weekend. And I was really hoping to see him back in that car just for one weekend, just around this one track. And unfortunately, it didn't happen. Yeah, what a shame. But th- there are bigger stories to talk of, right? It's firstly great to see Vettel. No, no, no. no, no. no. I'll tell are you the biggest not? story. No, no are they not? The biggest story, it's the funniest thing from the B Hotel. Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon, who actually had a fallout on the radio with the team on the last lap of the Japanese Grand Prix during the B Hotel painting project, they, Pierre Gasly and Ocon actually drew, drew, sorry, drew a heart with oh. an arrow and on one side they wrote ST and the other side they wrote Pierre and I remember even Charles Leclerc when he saw it he was like really for two guys who have been best friends and then worst rivals you know the friends turned for kind of things is that what you get so, so is Pierre but- ST bestie have we decoded it at last <laughs> <laughs> but let's stick to Checo Perez because I know that was one of the questions you asked me I didn't one answer second. because I found the B Hotel thing far more interesting no no before we go to Sergio Perez before we all get sucked into this black hole of confusion that the regulations have let's just do the due diligence that we have to do this is the Inside Line F1 podcast ladies and gentlemen uh, <laughs> my name is Samal Arora I can now very gladly say I'm the voice of the Indian Grand Prix at the MotoGP joined of course by Kunal Shah the former marketing head of the Force India F1 team, who now works at the Viaplay Network as an F1 consultant and also as an FIA accredited F1 journalist. I think I've said it twice. I'm just dead tired after a long weekend. I'm still trying to contemplate all that's just happened at the BIC. But uh, also, we've got F1 stats guru back in fit and healthy, and that makes me feel so good. But uh, Sundaram, watching this weekend, right, I've heard that good racing is therapeutic. And that surely must have made you feel so much better. Now, I'm not watching Sergio Perez because that move on Kevin Magnussen was, I think, nothing short of dropping a... Sorry, uh, kids, skip 15 seconds. That's like dropping a giant shit in the middle of the road. <laughs> How do you do that? That is a horrible move to make. But uh, apart from that, the racing that we saw this weekend is, frankly, it makes you feel better all the way through, no? Oh, it really did. And I think even I I watched the previous race in Singapore. So I was treated to some very good racing in these last two weeks. I think the previous race, I think Singapore was a much better racing spectacle overall. We did have quite a few battles around in Japan as well. But for some reason, I really don't know what's happening in in Checo Perez's mind. If if you thought that was an outrageous move uh, towards the end of the Singapore Grand Prix, what he pulled out <laughs> against Kevin Magnussen makes you wonder what is he even doing in that car. Uh, he had a terrible race start and it just kept going downhill after that. And what he pulled around the hairpin was just outrageous stuff. And especially at a track where you're winning the Constructors' Championship, especially at a track which is the home track of your engine supplier, you really don't want to be doing these sort of, pulling these sort of antiques. Antiques. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's back to the drawing board. <laughs> so, it's unfortunately back to the drawing board for, for Checo Perez once again. How how worse can it get for him is, is the big sorry, question. Sorry, did he just you, call it you an mean antique? That's so, I love that word, man. <laughs> it's, uh, it's unbelievable. But Kunal, uh, you, imagine... Sergio Perez at the celebration of the Constructors' Championship. Imagine all the engineers getting drunk, having a beer, celebrating. Would he even want to do a cheers over there? I'm just thinking. I mean, you know, Sundaram said, back to the drawing board. I wonder if his car is going to back to Adrian Newey's drawing board. So we need to fix this. Because for for a driver who's driving the fastest, most dominant car in literally the history of Formula 1, He's just 33 points behind a car that Mercedes say they want to bin in after after Abu Dhabi. The W14 will go in the bin is what Toto Wolff said. And what I was bummed about is, and I'm pretty sure Red Bull will be really even more bummed about. So they want to go, they want to make sure they get all the records in the season. They got the record for the most consecutive wins. Fine. They'll get driver's championship. Fine. They're doing all they can to get Checo Perez to number two. In the Drivers' Championship, they've never had a 1-2, which is fine. But they were also on a record, which was a 100% finish record. They were the only team on the grid 
to have finished all the races with both the cars, even if it meant that a car was outside of the points, which has happened with Perez a couple of times, right? But guess what? Even that record cannot be made this season, right? But we've actually beaten a lot about a lot around the bush on this whole Perez thing. And oh yeah, wait, okay, I'm gonna still beat around the bush. You spoke of the constructors championship celebration and the picture. There was one person very suspiciously missing from that picture, and that was Helmut Marco. I don't know why Helmut Marco was not in that picture, because he is also one of the architects of the Red Bull story. But now, stopping the whole beating around the bush, Checo Perez going out, doing an extra lap, serving his penalty, is absolutely the most Ooh. smart thing that Red Bull could do. Is that a call from Helmut he Marco? Is he, I, is he giving you an update? No, that's, <laughs> that somebody just wanted to enter the studio be like hey are you talking of marco <laughs> are you talking of red bull winning we need to all come and talk of red bull winning but what 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 perez actually did or rather red bull actually did was very smart they realized he's got a time penalty which he's not served could it risk into a grid penalty the next race and they went through the regulations which i'm pretty sure the sporting director just needed to clarify they probably also spoke to race control and said that's it our driver will go out for one lap serve the penalty, park the car. And let's remember, the whole car has retired is something we see on TV. But literally, till the race is on, you can come back, park your car, go have a tea, come back out again, go out again, and do that five times over. And you will still be considered as a participant in the race. You will be classified as a winner, even if you're 50 laps down to the leader. So... Checo Perez rejoining was actually absolutely within the rules. And the rule that needs to be reconsidered is what do you do in such cases where a time penalty is applied and a driver retires or is is out of the race, right? But it's also very tricky because you're not really retired. There isn't a definition to being retired. And a fun question for you both. Now imagine what would have happened if Perez rejoined the race and there was a red flag and there was a stoppage. <laughs> what lap? Would Checo Perez be rejoining the race from then? Oh my! Oh, it's a mathematical it's question. Mathematical. Not really. No, but uh, now that we're on this tangent of talking about things that are absolutely rubbish and make no sense, <laughs> which is what we're talking about with the B Hotel, uh, let's just dive into this stupid hypothetical situation because why not? Uh, ideally, correct me if I'm wrong, Sundaram, but he would rejoin on the same lap, like where he would join at the back of the field, back of the field. But he would be classified as 20 laps down. That's right, right? So he'll have to lap Max Verstappen 20 times, which means Max Verstappen would have to get out of his car, maybe have a tea, have a smoke, chillax with some friends, fist bump them, and then maybe he will end up uh, on the same lap as Max Verstappen because that's what it takes these days, no? No, no. In all seriousness, he would have, if, if I if I remember the regulations correctly, they he would not be on the same lap as Max Verstappen. He would still be 20 laps down. But yeah, just at the back of the grid, they are not going to equalize the laps uh, if, if red black red flag turns up. Thankfully. Now, just let's still build on this. And it's getting funny now. Okay? Yeah. What if there was a safety car? Would he be told to unlap the safety <laughs> car in the whole field 20 laps at a time so he gets onto the same lap as the race leader? But anyway, this is just saying this is how crazy Formula One and the rules can be. I'm just very glad, re, glad, re, my, I've had a, I woke up at four in the morning for Japan. It clearly just shows in my pronunciations, right? No, you're, you're also uh, very Norwegian. So it's also gla. You would say gla. Yeah, yeah, yeah so there gla. you go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, but, uh, you know, Red Bull were, you know, quick thinking on their feet, took them 20 laps, but, you know, they sent the driver back out, which I think was pretty good. They had two DNFs. I love that meme. They had two DNFs and neither was Max Verstappen. <laughs> exactly. But uh, what if I tell you guys that Red Bull have five contracted drivers for 2024 and uh, the one that is sitting out at the moment is the one who's proved the most in the last five races and the one who's in the top seat is the one who's proved the least in the last five odd races. Uh, mm, that something doesn't add up about Liam Lawson not you, being... You, you mean after, after Max Verstappen? <laughs> See, he, he is not in Formula. He's not in Formula One point five. He's in Formula One. Red Bull has, oh, sorry, Red Bull has 
four contracted F1.5 drivers at the moment in time. Yeah. One, one F1 driver. No, but uh, we, we'll get to that situation as well for a second. But all the other quirky stuff, right? I want to talk for a second, now that we're done smashing Sergio Perez into a rabbit hole now, uh, I want to talk for a second about racing, Sundaram, because we have seen more and more of it this time. And I think George Russell, I'm finally building up respect for him, because after that wacky wild battle with Daft Punk, uh, where he got pushed outside, he, Russell complained on the radio because he's a prima donna, obviously he will be, but he was a good guy. He came on and said, no, it was actually fair racing. So... At last, racing drivers are learning a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of self-awareness. Is that even a thing? Can that actually happen? It's it's absolutely funny that he said that. But I finally saw a few cracks ha- happening between him and Lewis Hamilton. And it, I think the cracks are also a little bit more widespread across other teams. You, have, you can see some cracks between both the Alpine drivers also between Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso. Finally, some cracks in that relationship as well. But yeah, but coming back to George Russell and, and Lewis Hamilton, I was in a way glad to see both of them fighting it out. Uh, we saw that even in, in uh, Monza between both the Ferrari drivers. So I was glad that we had that battle, probably surely not for the front of, of the grid, but it was good to see some nice hardcore action between both Mercedes drivers. It got a little uh, overboard uh, at, at times, but it was good to see both of them fighting it out together. And even then, Kunal, it's not just only them as teammates. We almost, almost saw Lando Norris having to make an effort to pass Oscar Piastri. Isn't it strange? I know Norris is the faster one. But somehow, every time Lando Norris approaches Oscar Piastri, it's just, hey, team, ask him to move out of the way. And he just gets what the job <laughs> is eventually. But on, the, on a more serious note, right? This entire podium, the average age, just 23 could you have ever imagined, like, I know uh, I'm going to make you feel old suddenly, Kunal, because you've been watching Formula One for far longer <laughs> than we have. But in, in in when you started out, right, back in the early, mid-90s of sorts, could you ever imagine a podium with drivers just age 23? And probably not even mature enough to, I don't know. What What is a 23-year-old not mature enough to do? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, after 21, you can do whatever you want by all the rules that world. Oh no, you can't. You can't be served. You up. can't be served alcohol in India. You need to be at the age of 25. So, really, I didn't know that. Oh no, some some clubs actually don't let you do that. So they're like, hey, 25 or not. So what's happened in Norris? Someone's got a someone's got a long way to go. But <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, but uh, you know, frankly, um, lots of team orders in place yesterday, at least four teams that we saw, team order, teamwork, McLaren, um, you know, Lando Norris, you explained it very well. He just came behind uh, Oscar and he's like, ah, I don't need to use my tires. I can use my radio. And at least the radio doesn't degrade, but the tires do, which they did more than 15, 20% than expected pre-event in Japan. Mercedes, of course, was uh, extremely... uh, you know, they, the drivers were fighting it out on track and they realized we'll just split strategies and, you know, keep some distance between them. Alpine, on the last lap, Pierre Gasly was furious. I'm surprised that it's not made the headlines, really, because he actually had to give a position to Ocon, which is when the team actually had you agreed pre-race that the strategy they were using, Ocon will... No, Gasly would undercut Ocon. So he's like, if I anyway just undercut him, why can't we just finish ninth and tenth the you know way we do? But anyway, and then the way we do, team, I think <laughs> the yeah. way we do is just such an underhand slight punch. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, but there, there, there was also uh, Ferrari, right? Because Ferrari uh, gave Leclerc a strategy, and Sainz was just under undercut. Before, he, he knew he was undercut. That's so typical Carlos Sainz. He knew he was undercut even before he pitted. He's suddenly just like, go on the radio. We've been undercut, haven't we? You know, like thinking about the pit wall. But let's spend a couple of minutes about the McLaren drivers because, <clears throat> you know, you said something, Somal, Norris is a quicker driver. I actually disagree with that. Oh, come on. I think Piastri. One second, one I know, second, I'll, one I'll, second. I'll, 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 how, 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 how? Let me just get settled okay. in. I'm properly crossing my legs now, Please. rubbing my hands. How? PS3 out-qualified him in Japan. Mm -hmm. PS3 only just got the upgrades in Japan. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to polarize the fan bases. I'm just telling you what I I read. 
Oscar Piastri, when he was asked, how was your race on Sunday? He said, it was great, podium, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, I'm not pleased with my outcome. And they said, what could you have done differently? And he said, tire management. He said, races like these, where there is higher tire degradation, the management is where biggest learnings of mine come. I haven't done too many of these races where I have to manage my tires, mm. right? And the only way to learn is by doing too many of these races where I manage my tires. So I think PS3 is only going to get stronger every time he does such races. He literally said, if I had to do the Japanese GP again, I would do a certain things differently, which would make me quicker. Because he outqualified Norris. And if he had all the understanding of using tires, right? And he actually said, you know, the opening stint was so slow that I was puzzled. And then when everybody else picked up pace, I couldn't respond because I ate up my tires while others hadn't, right? So mm. I'm excited to see now that PS3 has extended his, you know, stint with McLaren, etc., how strong he gets. And if there is a genuine Norris beater in PS3, that's going to be exciting. <laughs> Sorry. Uh yeah but <laughs> sorry just thought of something else but no uh, i i if you put it that way it kind of makes sense because i remember belgium as well uh, oscar piastri such a great qualifying but you could just see how his car wasn't as good as landon norris towards the end because he couldn't manage the tires so isn't it fun sundaram that we get to see the development of a driver right before our eyes and in another case we also get to see the frustrations of a driver uh boiling all the way through in front of our eyes in the case of Fernando Alonso because now we were all wondering right when is the honeymoon period going to be over I said by Monza they're probably going to be cursing each other Alonso and Stroll like daddy Stroll that is but uh, it's just taken a couple of races more for Alonso to open up the firing so we're not too far off I think just we can in a 23 race calendar two races is just about okay so I think we're we should just head to Aston Martin to collect our bed debts because We've, we've gotten it right this time out, finally. I'm only surprised that the honeymoon period is actually over between Aston Martin and Fernando because I expected that not to happen this year at all. I thought Fernando was always going to be uh, extremely sweet towards the team and, and their engineers. But unfortunately, you guys kind of knew Fernando uh, better than me. <laughs> and uh, it had to happen. Aren't you the biggest Fernando Alonso fan here, my friend? <laughs> For some reason, I was much more optimistic. I, I had just this sort of a feeling that Fernando is not going to utter one bad thing against the car or the team. And unfortunately, it all comes down in Japan for some reason. It always has to be Japan. The one place where he calls the engine, the Honda engine, a GP2 engine, that engine goes on to win the championship uh, in, in that in this year. I mean, yesterday, they won the championship yesterday in probably what was... An almost spotless year for Honda. So, yeah, but I'm, I'm just surprised to see the way the, the Aston Martin has fallen backwards in terms of development, in terms of pace. He, he did very well on, on the race start from P10 to P6, but clearly there was no pace in that car at all to even challenge the Ferraris or the Mercs or, yeah, just... Terrible, uh, a terrible outing for Fernando and Aston Martin. Uh, Kunal, I think they need drivers that are a little bit less committed heading into the corners, no? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't understand the reference, oh, folks, uh, after Singapore, Mike Crack just said, uh, the, uh, <laughs> sorry, just, I can't say it without a straight, uh, with a straight face. But uh, after the Singapore qualifying crash for Lance Troll, which is great to see that he's okay now, uh, Mike Crack came to the media and said that, the crash shows Lance Stroll's commitment into the corner. <laughs> they, uh, I think I think they would have need uh, they would need drivers that are a little less committed because I think the engineers are going overboard with their commitment, but the drivers just aren't able to keep up. But in all honesty, in all honesty, uh, isn't it funny how uh, the upgrades are really changing the dynamic? How even though we've seen lots of changing chopping here and there, the underlying characteristics of the car for someone like Ferrari are also saying similar. And when the high deck races. They're just not able to be as good as they could potentially be. So I find this underlying story to the Formula 1 season as well so much fun. Where you can test and figure out car characteristics, behavior, driver temperaments and all that as well. I, I, even, yes, we might have a dominant winner. But the sport is like, if you just care to do an effort, Formula 1 is really turning out to be super entertaining this year. Yeah, and you know... 
The Aston Martin versus McLaren battle is so interesting. And I'll tell you one of my stories from Force India with Williams. We started, Force India started the season really strong. We were scoring points like left, right and center. Okay. Uh, Williams started really badly. And this is typical how most teams end up doing things. You had to start with a very strong baseline car, throw everything at it at the start of the year. And then just, you know, after a point, you run out of steam, right? Through the, as the season goes. In the other phase, you start with a solid baseline, but you don't throw everything at it at the start of the year. And then you keep adding bits and pieces as the season goes. So the the first part being how Aston Martin approached this seven podiums, whatever that they had in the first so many of our races, etc. And then the second approach is what McLaren has had, right? Which is they started so bad that everybody's like, oh, forget Aston Martin's jump from 22 to 23. We need McLaren's jump from start of 23 to middle of 23 you know suddenly the the development is done in a far shorter time period uh, or at least it seems so when it's done in season rather than between seasons right but yes like sundaram said just japan and fernando alonso things because he was like oh thank you for this car i love it and now suddenly he's like you guys have put thrown me to the lions by pitting me this early and then one of the times he's like i need more straight line speed to make an overtake give me more straight line speed and and so on and McLaren, I get a feeling, will overtake Aston Martin. Six races to go, 49 points. They will make an overtake. Also, very interestingly, Lando Norris is seventh in the Drivers' Championship with 115 points, equal with George Russell, who's actually eighth, Whoa. right? So I get a feeling Lando Norris is going to end up catching maybe Leclerc, who's 20 points ahead as well. So, of course, a lot of this will depend on lots of tracks and re- reliability and performance and so on. But that McLaren recovery is incredible. But it's such a fun battle. You've got Leclerc, Norris and George Russell all fighting for the same place in the championship, legitimately with one bad race for any one of them, changing the entire order, toppling them over and them out. I, this is, um, frankly, uh, if... Uh, I remember, right? I remember the year 2019 when all of these uh, rookies came in and Charles Leclerc had a second year. We were all buzzing and so excited about them, just wondering when these guys will be the future of the sport and when they'll fight for wins and titles and championships. And it's fun, Sundaram, that we get to see their evolution in front of us. And it's fun that we get to see character changes. Like George Russell, he was the nice and polite young rookie, but now he's being outspoken. He's putting his elbows out. He's actually also making errors here and there, which is a different thing altogether. But uh, I I like how they've developed as people, uh, developed as characters in front of us. And this Japanese GP was just another example of exactly that, where we saw this amazing battle between Russell and Hamilton. And also, uh, dare I say, what we saw with Charles Leclerc just having his race disintegrate in front of his eyes as well. Yeah, and that's the thing we we get to see with a lot of lot of drivers, just seeing sort of characters the way they've evolved. Even for Charles Leclerc, seeing Lando Norris starting off uh, struggling in, in the McLaren in in, in 2019, 2020 onwards, and then just coming into his own and doing exceptionally well, receiving the pra- praise of uh, even Lewis Hamilton from time to time. I'm absolutely. I absolutely love the fact that we get to see these sort of drivers turn into so, the sort of, uh, you know, um, what do you say, come out to the sort of potential that we we expected them to do. George Russell or even Oscar Piastri. I'm absolutely blown away by what we are seeing with Oscar Piastri in his rookie year. Oh, yeah. Scoring a rookie podium in his, in his rookie year. It's, 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 we, we haven't seen that in six years. I mean, interestingly, in Baku 2017 was the last time we saw a rookie on the podium. And that was also a race where Sergio Perez retired, rejoined and retired once again. <laughs> ah. quick, quick detour this one. But but yes, we, we, we're getting to see all of these drivers really come into their own and, and do exceptionally well. And I'm just waiting to see when these drivers will go on and win races. We, we unfortunately haven't seen that yet with Max Verstappen at the front. But I'm really waiting to see when we can have George Russell fighting it out with Charles Leclerc or Lando Norris for a race. But who's the rookie in 2017 they, Baku? One second. Sorry, but Lance Stroll. Lance Stroll, yeah. But he came, oh, he, oh, oh, good point, good point. You were saying, Kral? He, he should have finished second, but Botas pipped him on the line. I thought he came in 16 right? for a second, but just got my math messed up. But No, no. In 16, that he drove 100,000 100, kilometers in testing with Papa Stroll's money, <laughs> with the Williams. Um, anyway, no, but that was saying, a race, Sundaram. 
that that was a race that had everything. That was a race that had the little incident between Sebastian Vettel, the the brake testing incident between Sebastian Vettel and Lewis Hamilton, and that was also the race that had the steering wheel. Give me the steering wheel incident with Kimi <laughs> Raikkonen. He also retired, rejoined, and retired from the race. So it was actually a duo that that weekend. Yeah. It was Perez as well as Raikkonen who did the same thing. And we thought it was only Red Bull who was smarter and flouting rules. But anyway, but this whole Ferrari Mercedes battle was very interesting, you know. And Lewis actually managed to beat one Ferrari, which he said he was very proud of because they are very closely, uh, they're very close in the in the constructors' championship, which we which we all know. It's just twenty points between them, right? Yep. Something, yeah, yep. three zero five to Mercedes and two eighty five, and. The the truth is, it was all down. They were so closely matched in performance. It was all down to what strategy you use to get track position. And that's essentially what happened with Hamilton. And George Russell, for all that he did, he chose a one-stopper in a race where everybody else did a two-stop. He was managing his tire so heavily that it, you know, his call for not wanting to fight with Lewis just didn't make sense. If anything, they should have just let Lewis clear off even further into the distance to sort of get him to be safe. But that that actually makes me believe the the Japanese Grand Prix was a massive race on high speed game of chess, which is also something that we know Formula One to be, because so many teams and drivers approached the weekend differently. Somebody like Max Verstappen actually started on the back foot. He had two sets of medium while uh, just one set of hard and McLaren and Mercedes had the reverse. They had one set of medium and two sets of the hard and the hard was supposed to be a better race uh, tire just given the how much degradation otherwise was being experienced. And then there was somebody like Nico Hulkenberg, 14th. He started the race on a medium. He went eight laps on the soft and then he did 16 laps on the hard. Huh. So he actually used all three compounds, right? And a bit a bit puzzling, but yeah, it was it was great with the strategy. You see, that's more like it. I'm convinced that Nico Hulkenberg is the eco warrior, using every single compound of tires that we've got right here, not leaving anything to waste. But interesting you put it that way about Formula One being a high speed game of chess, because we've all seen uh, mm-hmm. we've all seen yeah. a pawn promotion. We all saw George Russell this running his way past in the Williams for three years, eventually getting a Mercedes. But instead of getting promoted to a queen, he ended up becoming a horse with that Mercedes that we have at the moment in time. But uh, what would a castle be in a Formula 1 game? Like, uh, would that be what Carlos Sainz did in Singapore? Getting the elephant in Landon Norris behind him and protecting himself being the king of the circuit? No? Or is that a too technical reference at the moment in time? Well, let's move on to something uh, somewhat lighter, somewhat better, somewhat uh, more controversial, shall we? This one didn't land. The visibility around Delhi today is uh, not very good. The clouds are actually pretty uh, pretty dense, so my jokes aren't quite landing today. But uh, the point being, I am uh, still a little bit confused and conflicted about Alpha Tauri, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, because, as I mentioned earlier on, they have chosen not to sign Liam Lawson for 2025. This again, news, uh, 2024, I'm sorry, uh, news announced again this weekend at the Japanese GP. Of course, we expected an announcement, but I am low-key, I'm low-key disappointed, Sundaram, even though I like Daniel Ricciardo, I have no affinity towards him, but uh, the, the only, I mean, I know they didn't want to be harsh to him because he ended up breaking his hand and all that stuff, but like, if you have a talent who's literally doing so well, uh, why would you break his momentum? And ask him to wait for a year and then come back. Uh, I know you, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're, uh, you're Alpha Tauri at this moment in time. But what would you have done? And do you think they've made the right call by choosing Ricardo? If this was a different year, maybe if this was for the 2023 season, they wouldn't have gone for Ricardo is what I feel. The only fact that in 2024, they're doing a lot of rebuilding, even in terms of management and even in terms of how the car is going to function, is why I believe they have gone with Daniel Ricciardo, who would probably help them in terms of development, developing the car. If it wasn't the case, then they would have gone for Liam Lawson. And I'm only surprised that Honda still has a say with who they have in the second car of, of that Alpha Tauri. Also considering that Honda is going to be uh, teaming up with Aston Martin a few years into the future. But that's largely what I believe they're thinking is they are 
still backing Yuki Tsunoda in the other car. They're going with experience is, is why Daniel Ricciardo has been selected. But really have to take a second to appreciate what Liam Lawson has been doing. Coming in midway into the season, a replacement's replacement. Coming in and doing well <laughs> and doing better than Yuki Tsunoda, actually. he's he's got He got P9 last time out in Singapore, which was the best result by any Alpha Tauri driver. And also... Finally, he's had the opportunity to go up against Yuki uh, in a more fair fight this time out in in Japan. And he's actually outraced him as well in P11. So otherwise, I feel feel he's done an exceptional job. But sooner or or later, Liam Lawson will be in a full-time F1 uh, drive. I get the feeling Liam Lawson will be or has signed a full-time drive for 2025, which is why he's accepted a reserve role in 2024 the only the only part where you know it's a bit of a surprise is red bull's judgment of liam lawson's talent was not as strong because last year they picked nick de Vries after he did well in one race literally right and they put him in the car and then we saw what happened this year like you pointed out sundaram he's a replacement to a replacement right and then suddenly he seems like the star driver right I also get this feeling that Red Bull appreciate what Yuki Tsunoda has done. And a lot of times it's about progression that you end up doing as as a driver, right? And that progression is where they would probably have seen Yuki Tsunoda do see session by session uh, against uh, Nick DeFries, against, uh, you know, Daniel Ricciardo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, crucially, Monza and Singapore were two races that Sunoda didn't end up doing a single lap on it. Monza here did not yep. start in in Singapore. He was taken out literally in the first uh, lap itself uh, by <laughs> Mr. Checo Perez himself. So, in in all fairness, I, I'm pretty pleased with their situation because they will have a lot of pressure for Checo Perez as well as for Ricardo. Both of them cannot rest on laurels for their seat. There are youngsters who are sort of there to make themselves. Uh, eligible for that seat as well. And for once, after all those jokes on Red Bull, if you remember when we did the pre-event, pre-season pit stop in Mumbai in January, we laughed saying Red Bull's last four hires were all outside of their driver pool, Checo Perez and Albin and whoever else, and Nick De Vries as well, right? Uh, and now it's back to Yuki Sonoda from the pool, Liam Lawson from the pool, both of them doing a very solid job to make sure that the veterans of Formula One, Perez and Ricardo, will be under pressure to perform it. They will not be able to rest on Ricardo, for example. He's there for marketing reasons. That never makes sense to me, but it it won't make sense if he doesn't perform either. Yeah, because I, I remember speaking to a CEO of a very successful sports team in India once, and I asked him, how much do you sign players based on marketing reasons? And his simple answer was, if the team does well, we get our marketing on our own. So there's no point of signing a star player who doesn't play well. Firstly, you need the results and then you get everything else. But I, I don't know. It's an unproven quantity as well, Daniel Ricciardo, which makes it so much fun. But uh, enough on uh, all of this. One last thing to ask. Well, one big question for all of you as well. Folks, on social media, I'd love to know your answer to this question. What was your moment of the race. But uh, we're doing this a little late. Sundaram, we'll start with you on this one. Ah, Kunal, you are very eager to tell more. So, what is what is your moment of the race? I almost thought you were going to be like, hey guys, put it on social media. We'll see you after. And I said, no, 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 wait, I, I need to talk. And I think the start, most definitely the start was one of the most exciting stuff because uh, the McLarens had a better launch than Red Bull Racing's uh, Max Verstappen. He had Oscar Piastri on the right, and then he had Lando Norris on the left. They almost got the jump on him. And I remember after qualifying, Norris made a reference to Senna and Prost, and he was telling Oscar, take Max out, and I'll go win the race. And uh, and uh, Oscar Piastri, after the race, actually said, I, had, I was in the perfect position to do what Prost and Senna did. I could have just taken Max out of the race, and they were all joking about it. But just goes to show those McLarens are quick starters and their 2-3 result was not uh, on circumstances. It was on merit. They were the second fastest car and they didn't get a 3-4. They got a 2-3, and three, which in itself is pretty phenomenal. What was your moment of the weekend all the way through? Because was it something with the racing? Was it something with the strategy? Because I personally 
can't look beyond that lap one battle between Yuki Tsunoda and Liam Lawson. Just the way they were shaping up the lines, just the way they were undercutting and overcutting each other. And also what happened at the spoon curve constantly over time with I think it was Sainz and the McLarens as well. I think it was both the Mercedes drivers as well. That is why we love motor racing. So that for me is mind blowing. What else comes to mind as your moment of the race? My moment of the race was definitely Sergio Perez trying to get past Kevin Magnussen. No, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> my 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 moment of the race would probably be Lewis Hamilton overtaking Fernando Alonso al- uh, around one thirty R. For the longest time, we've, we all, we've always spoken highly of how Alonso managed to get past Michael Schumacher in the 2005 Japanese Grand Prix around 130R. And I think we've found another version of that. I think Lewis Hamilton getting past Fernando there was a very ballsy move, in my opinion. And he did it on the inside, not on the outside, which is even more interesting. He did interesting. it on the inside. Yeah. He did like, it on the inside, Yes. And that for Fernando Alonso might be just like a flashback of sorts. Like, oh no, 20 years have passed now. I'm no longer that young driver, no longer in a promising team. I'm stuck with uh, uh, quite a bit of stroll money, but also with a stroll car, unfortunately, the way things have gone. But no, at the end of the day, uh, before we just very, very quickly wrap up, let's uh, also just give a word to Red Bull. No? We, don't, we don't like to spend a lot of time talking about the domination, but... Guys, that makes it three championships in a row. Uh, 23, no, no, two, two, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. 22 felt like a couple of seasons actually won because it was that boring. But uh, 22 and 23 won again six Constructors World Championships for Red Bull Racing. I know there's not much to be said, but uh, yeah, how big of an achievement is it, Kunal? I think it's a mega achievement. I mean, Red Bull winning a car racing championship when they are essentially an energy drinks company that's the dna of their you know that's their origin they are an energy drinks company they are beating some of the best manufacturers most known manuf- car manufacturers in the world in car racing and if you ask me red bull are the modern day ferrari i think formula 1 cannot do without red bull anymore just the way all these years we've grown up to this idea of ferrari and Formula 1 are equal, and Formula 1 cannot do without Ferrari. I think Red Bull has joined those ranks in my mind. Ooh, that's a big one. That is a big, big commitment to make. But uh, again, for all the Red Bull fans out here, if you are not celebrating, grab a couple of Red Bulls. Make it your own. But folks, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Japanese GP Review on the Inside Line F1 podcast. We'll be back for Qatar. We'll be back with more special episodes as well. So stay tuned, subscribe to the podcast, share it with all your friends and family members, and we'll be back for more very soon. Bye-bye.